quantum mechanics with an amazing field of science, with these mysterious atoms, complex electrons, and uncertain uncertainty. It's really quite enchanting, but we can't get into it quite yet, because you see, in order to understand just how quantum mechanics works, we'll first have to understand the underlying math. So let's start simple, with something that many people consider complex, even though it's not. Let's start with a vector. Most people think of vectors as just arrows in three-dimensional space. Which is wrong. Kind of. It's a misconception. In reality, vectors are just multiple numbers. So why would we think of them as arrows in three-dimensional space? Well, let's imagine a basketball with some velocity. So for example, this kind of velocity. Now what this arrow represents is that after one second the basketball will be at the end of it, so it will traverse this distance in one second. That's the velocity. But how would we describe this arrow mathematically? Well, we can break it down into multiple different arrows. We can check just how far to the right the ball will go, just how far forward, just how far up. Now we can note down these values and there we go. That's a vector. Now even though this may seem obvious and it may seem simple and it may seem like something that's just so standard that would be pointless to even write it down in math, I mean yeah, it is obvious that the end of this arrow has the same position as the end of this arrow plus this arrow plus this arrow, but even though this setup is simple, that does not limit its potential, potential of this discovery, because from it you can get some pretty amazing things. Like for example, addition. So first, what's going to happen if we add together two different vectors? What will the result be equal to? Well, in order to get the sum of these vectors, we just move the second one to the tip of the first one, or the first one to the tip of the second one. The new vector is just the sum of the previous two, and right here, on the very beginning of our three-dimensional journey, we can already see the first property of vectors. Because we can think of them as either sum of vectors, or sum of parts of vectors. They are both the same thing. Which leads me to the next bit, multiplication. What is multiplication? Well, if you multiply 5 by 3, for example, what basically means is that you have to add up 5 3 different times. It's the same thing with vectors. If you multiply our vector by 3, then what basically means is that we just add 3 of these vectors together. And since we already know that adding vectors together gives you the same result as adding their parts together, then we know that multiplying a vector by 3, for example, has the same effect as multiplying the parts of the vector by 3. So that's how you multiply vectors. And using this, we can actually already have some linear fun. We can talk about unit vectors. And the idea looks like this. We take our vector and we divide it into two parts, the unit part and the scalar part. The unit part here is direction and the scalar part is the magnitude. Or in other words, the unit part points an arrow somewhere and the scalar part scales the arrow. Yeah, I know, math is really hard and complex. I mean, you, you're gonna tell me that scalars scale things? This is crazy. Now this gets really fun once you realize two things. First of all, we can think of our own lovely vector as a sum of different unit vectors scaled by a scalar, and second, we can rescale and move our unit vectors. But what does that mean? Well, first, I should introduce the basis vectors. Basis vectors are just vectors that define the space we're currently in. And I know there's a lot of technical words here and such, but I'm just going to insert this animation here and shut up, because this should really speak for itself. Those three arrows defining the entire space are our basis vectors. Now, back to our more complex vector. So if we imagine it being equal to something like 3, 6, and 2.5, then here's what we're basically doing. We're taking the first basis vector, we scale it up by 3, then we take the second basis vector, we scale it up by 6, and then we take the third basis vector, and we scale it up by 2.5. You can see we are using the basis vectors as unit vectors, and then we're scaling them up by the components of our main, more complex vector. Now, after seeing this, you're probably thinking something like, okay, make it. That's cool and no? all, but like, it's not really cool. It just feels like you're slowly but surely complicating a concept of a freaking arrow. I mean, the first definition was good enough. Just an arrow pointing somewhere. Why would we need to complicate things into this mess of a thing? And that's a valid concern. But now, using this mess of a thing, as you've so nicely put it, we can move the basis vector around. But before we get into it, let's first note down the coordinates of our 
first basis vector, second basis vector, third basis vector, and the resulting complex vector. All right, you ready? Here we go. There, now wasn't that cool? <laughs> Oh, no, was it? Okay, well, what if I were to tell you that this is actually what matrix transforms look like? This is how they actually walk. Oh, still no. Oh, because you don't know what are matrix transforms. Well, here's what matrix transforms are all about. Now what would matrix transforms be used for? Well, let's say that you're a madman with no social life who spends all their time walking to make content for five YouTube channels and... Oh, whoops, got carried away a bit, uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> I meant... there we go. Let's say that you're a 3D animator who'd like to render an animation like this. A tetrahedron getting rotated upside down. How could you do it? Well, first things first, this tetrahedron is defined with four points. All of these points have their very own coordinates, or in other words, their own vector describing them. So you can think of the action of rotating this tetrahedron as just transforming these four vectors using a matrix. So what matrix should we use? Well, let's think about it. Starting with what the matrix is, we already know that these vectors can be described as just these three basis vectors rescaled. Now the action of applying a matrix basically means that changing the basis vectors around to new ones. Now this simplifies the problem significantly, because right now, all we have to do is just rotate these three vectors around, and all the others will follow. With this single matrix, we can rotate the entire thing. There, now wasn't that cool? Yeah, it was, it's an amazing explanation. It's actually so good of an explanation that I can't even take credit for it because Free Blue and Brown already did it seven years ago. Great! I mean, okay, the tetrahedra stuff, that was mine, but the Matrix explanation, that was free, that I, I just got that from Free Blue and Brown. So there we go. Now you understand the vectors and the matrices and matrix transformations really well, which really you understand the bread and butter of linear algebra. But there is still one more pickle. Now here's where we come to the main misunderstanding of the vectors, because you see so far I've been showing you them as these arrows in 3D space, which is great for explaining their properties, but also unbelievably misleading. Let's take matrices for example. If I were to show you matrices only with how we compute matrix transforms, so basically this equation, you probably wouldn't understand a single thing, because there was just straight up too much addition, multiplication and mess going on. I mean look at this, it's a mess! But if I were to explain to you what this equation means exactly, showcase how these first three values are just coordinates of the red arrow, these three are coordinates of the green arrow, these three are the coordinates of the blue arrow, and if I were to tell you this, that this coordinate scales the red arrow, this one scales the green arrow, and this one the blue one, it becomes much easier to understand just how these matrices work. But this actually introduces a bit of a misconception, and by a bit, I mean awful lot. Because you see, as nice as this visual is, that's all this. Just the visual. The equation is the underlying math. What do I mean by that? Well, let's consider a matrix transform with four values. So four by four matrix on a four number vector. We already know what this means. We just multiply the first one by the first scalar, second by the second, third by third, four by fourth. Then we just add them together and there we go. We've just solved a four dimensional matrix transform. Now let's imagine we do the same thing except in three dimensions. Well, we start with nothing. There really isn't a single good way to visualize four number vectors in 3D. And that's the biggest misunderstanding there is about vectors in linear algebra in general, in my opinion. You see, linear algebra can be explained well using three-dimensional arrows because these arrows can be visualized using multiple numbers. So this explains linear algebra well because it uses linear algebra in a graphic way. But it's not the other way around. Arrows come from linear algebra, not algebra from arrows. 
That's why even though it may seem really difficult solving math for four-dimensional objects, it isn't really that much harder than solving it for three-dimensional objects. You just add one more number. When you hear some sort of n-dimensional phenomena in math, it doesn't actually mean this many dimensions. It only means this many numbers to solve it. So next time you hear someone brag about solving an eighth-dimensional function, kick him in the nuts. Now there we go, the basics of linear algebra behind us. We can finally move on to... Functions. Let's start with this. An equation. From the word equal, because the left side of the equation is equal to the right. This seems simple enough, and I feel like it doesn't really require an explanation, since we all kind of get what equations are about. So let's have some fun. So let's replace the 1 with a 2. Now, because this is an equality, both sides have to change to remain equal. So since we added 1 to the left, we also add 1 to the right. Now let's replace the 2 with a 4. Once again, we've added 2 to the left, so we have to add 2 to the right to keep things equal. Alright, but what's going to happen if we replace the 1 with a 2? Well, in order to keep things equal, we have to add a 2 to the right, but hold on now. We've added only 1 to the left. Why do we need to add a 2 to the right? What's more, if we replace the 3 with a 4, we're gonna need to subtract from the result, even though we once again added 1 to the left. What's going on? Well, most of you probably already figure out what's going on, and that is, even though we are adding stuff to the left, we're adding them to different portions of the equation. So for example, right here we're adding 1, right here we're adding 1 to a number that's multiplied by 6, but divided by 3, and right here we're adding 1 to the number, but a number that's dividing. So even though we are adding 1 to these amounts of different operations, that's what functions are used for, checking just how these equations' results change based on the different values. So, for example, if we replace the 4 with an x, now we can just say that the function f of x is equal to this equation. And so what we basically do is we just insert some value into our equation in order to get the result. So if we insert 1 into our equation, we'll get 1 plus 1 third times 6. If we insert 7, we'll get 7 plus 1 third times 6. And now what we can do is we can just plot these values on the graph, and there we go. We just got a visual showcasing just how function is changing. Now for something simple like this, it could be pretty straightforward. <laughs> get it straightforward, because it's a straight line. But there are more complex functions. Like for example, let's check what's going to happen when we replace the 3 with an x. Well, now we insert 5 into our equation, we get 5 plus 1 fifth times 6. We insert 2, we get 2 plus 1 half times 6. And if we just keep on inserting every single value and plotting them, we'll get this. A graph showcasing just how this function changes. Now, before we move on from this chapter, I should also mention that functions can have more than one input. If you are creating a function with more than one input, all you have to do is just insert more variables, as simple as it could be. Which would lead me to the next chapter, which is... Now that we have these graphs, we have to ask ourselves another question. Because, yeah, when we have a function like this, we can say that right here it's going up, right here it's going down, right here it's going a bit flat, that all makes sense. But, just how much is it going up or down exactly? Just like with matrices, it's the same situation. When we have a tetrahedron, we know what the rotation looks like, but in order to actually rotate something, we need to create a mathematical tool to help us, like matrices. Right here we have a function, and we know if it's going up or down. But in order to use it, we need to create a mathematical tool to describe this. And in this case, this mathematical tool is a derivative. First, we're going to start the definition for a derivative. This. This is the definition. Now, I'll leave it on hold for now, I'll explain what it means soon, but first, let's talk about velocity. Let's imagine that we have a car on two axes, the position axis and the time axis. This just represents the position of the car, so how far forward or how far backwards it is. The time axis represents how things are changing, so for example, if a car has a velocity equal to this, then what that means is that after one second has passed, it will traverse this distance. So that's what the velocity is, the change of position in relation to change in time. We could already get it from the units, because velocity is measured in meters per second, which means it's the ratio between distance and time. So this is how we measure average velocity in physics. 
the initial position and the initial time, subtract from them the final position and final time. Now what we get is the difference in position and the difference in times, so let's say that our car stay with position equal to 1 meter from the origin on the 7th second, and then after 1 second its position was equal to 3 meters from the origin. So 3 meters minus the original position of 1 meter gives us a difference of 2 meters. And the time when we ended our measurement is equal to 8 seconds, we started at 7 seconds, so our measurement lasted for 1 second. Now we divide the position difference by the time difference and we get 2 meters per second. That's the average velocity. The process is actually really easy to understand graphically now that we have this plane with time and position. Now one thing which you might realize is that the higher the position difference, the higher the velocity. The higher the time, the lower the velocity. And there is another way we could interpret this graphically. The higher the position, the higher the slope. The lower the position, the lower the slope. The higher the time, the lower the slope. The lower the time, the higher the slope. And I know that it's a lot of words, but my point is that we have something that directly reflects velocity. And that's just how far up and down the function is going. And what's more is that we also have a way to compute an average slope. So the average direction in a function. Let's imagine a function like this. How far up is it going on an average between these two points? Well, that's simple. Take the second point position, subtract the first positions from it, and divide. There we go. That's our average slope. But why do I keep on insisting on calling it the average? Well, because averages are inaccurate sometimes. What if we compute the average slope between these two points? Well, we get a slightly negative value, since the second point is lower than the first one. But... In the beginning, the function is clearly going up. So what we want is not the average slope, only the slope at the point. So slope in this point, for example, except this doesn't make much sense. I mean, in order to find a slope, we need two points. If we just have one point, if we insert into our equation, we get zero divided by zero, which causes a lot of problems. And that's where the beauty of calculus really shines, because we solve this problem by not solving it only sidestepping the issue. But isn't that life, though? That's what limits are used for. We basically ask not what if those two points were in the same spot, only what if the second point more and more approaches the first one? What does the result approach then? Well, it might seem like something difficult to compute, but it's actually really easy, and you'll see what I mean by sidestepping the issue. Let's say that we'd like to find out what is the slope at any point of the function x squared. Well, here's what we'd normally do. The difference in y divided by the difference in x. So first, x is equal to the position of the first x, and the second x is equal to the position of the second x. Now, first y is equal to first x plugged into a function, and the second y is equal to the second x plugged into a function. Now, if we just have a distance between these two points, then we can just note down the second x as just the first x plus h. There we go. That's our equation. The issue happens if the second point is on top of the first one, because then h is equal to 0, which means that our equation falls apart. x minus x is equal to 0, f of x minus f of x is equal to 0, we get 0 by 0 again. So what are we to do? Well, here's where we come to sidestepping the issue. Let's just say that we have no idea what h is equal to. I mean, how could we possibly know, right? It's an unknown. Now let's try to solve the equation. Our function is equal to x squared, so we just insert this and we solve the equation. It's not that hard to solve, and in the end we get this. x squared minus x squared gives us 0, so we just cancel them out. And we get 2xh plus h squared divided by h. So now let's divide them, and there we go. 2x plus h. Now after all the calculations are said and done, we just all of a sudden remember that h is equal to zero. So we just input it in and there we go. 2x. That's the slope of this function at any point. Here you can see an arrow representing that and yeah, it fits. Now this initial definition of a limit should make more sense. Now also another calculus thing is integrals, but when it comes to integrals they are just antiderivatives. So just like when you add 4 to something, subtracting 4 would reverse it. Just like when you're multiplying something by 3, dividing by 3 would reverse it. In the same way when you derive a function, integration would reverse it. And for reasons, integrals are just equal to the area under the function. There we go. This is all the basic math you'll need. 
which means that now we can finally go into 